Sunday Baroque Conversations is made possible by the Friends of Sunday Baroque and is produced at WSHU Public Radio in Fairfield, Connecticut. I'm Suzanne Bona. Thanks for listening. Don't miss an episode of Sunday Baroque Conversations. Subscribe on Apple, Google, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave us a review. If you want to find out where you can listen to our weekly show, visit our website, sundaybaroque.org, for a station list and our 24-7 stream. Again, that's sundaybaroque.org. Mesdames, Messieurs, I pray you all don't move. A man's been murdered. You must help to prove who did the deed. Jean-Marie Leclerc was a respected French violin player and composer who lived from 1697 to 1764 when one October night he was stabbed to death in his Paris home. And his shocking death generated lots of speculation and it inspired a concert called Who Killed Leclerc. The early music group Infusion Baroque is featured, and its violinist Salini Amawat joins me along with their collaborator, Mike Fan, to talk about the performance. Hi. Hi, Suzanne. Hi there. So I, I let's start from the very beginning, though, because I'd like to know how you know one another and how this, this sort of came about that you were going to collaborate. How'd you meet? So I, Mike and I have a mutual friend and uh, I had gone to see a performance that they were producing and performing in Montreal. I think it was two, two summers ago. Um, and this, uh, I think Mike can, can maybe tell you a little bit about it later, but uh, this group is called uh, Opera Queens. And it's basically um, just a really, really wonderful take on opera, sort of flipping gender roles and really, really taking things outside of the box. Um, so I went to go see their performance in Montreal and I actually didn't meet Mike at first, but their sort of counterpart or counter- uh, um, Drag persona. I, yes, drag persona, <laughs> yeah. Tanya Smanya, who I was just absolutely charmed with. Um, and she was singing a role in a Handel opera. And I think just throughout the performance, I was just very impressed with, with both Tanya and, and Mike's sort of stage presence. And, you know, at the time we were looking for somebody to fulfill this, this role in this production, uh, which was basically a one person show. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we, we can talk more about that later as well, but I just thought Mike would be a wonderful fit for this. So, um, after the after seeing their performance in Montreal, we I think we went out for a late for a late pizza mm -hmm. or something, yeah. and we just yeah. uh, there was a lot of people. We we chatted a bit, but then I contacted Mike uh, maybe a few months afterwards and just sort of reintroduced myself and and asked if they would be interested in taking this on. Oh, cool! Does that is that the full story, Mike, or do you want to add to that? Yeah, it's so it's so fascinating. I'm, I mean, I'm glad it was a positive experience because. Yeah, this uh, I obviously was trained first as a classical pianist and then now as an opera singer. Um, when I first started singing, I was more in Baroque repertoire and my instrument has kind of grown over the years. So I sing more kind of like the more lyric romantic repertoire now. And um, so you never know because I was there was some Handel on the program. I was singing some scenes as Carmen and uh, there was a variety of roles, mostly uh, in my female presenting persona, Tani's Mania. Uh, as Sal Salini um, mentioned. And um, I mean, it was wonderful to meet her, fellow musician and classical music of Asian descent. Very exciting and really um, interested to know about her and her company. And I uh, had no idea this was waiting for me, but it was such an interesting experience. It was something that I think was, um, you know, I'm always surprised by the work that I'm doing 
I, I'm thinking it's, you know, so weird or strange in so many years I've kind of almost like been in the closet in a way because I've been afraid of showing this side of myself. But I really found since doing that, it's really brought so many interesting people into my sphere, such as Cellini and all of the wonderful folks at Infusion. And uh, I was very surprised when Cellini wrote me. And But when I read about the project, how, you know, there are all these characters, uh, three of them are male presenting, one is female presenting. And I'm actually trained at first as an actor before in the middle of uh, my pianist to singer journey, I did actually start in Shakespeare and kind of work in theater. I ran a theater company in, my, in, in one of my undergrad degrees and, um, and Selena didn't know any of this. And then, but when I read it, it just seemed everything was so aligned. Uh, I was also probably like, well, I can see why they are looking for someone who's, who on earth would be crazy to sign up to do it. And clearly I was, but what a wonderful experience and what an interesting kind of um, kismet of things that kind of brought us together and in this sphere. But um, since getting to work with them, we just, I, I continue to be pleasantly surprised of the similarities and commonalities between us, just in terms of our approach, uh, trying to kind of open up uh, classical and broke music in a really unique way and uh, present it to new audiences in a new fresh take so it was uh, I think I was probably most surprised of all but um, it was really delightful and I'm really pleased that it's uh, to have been involved in this project and to continue to be part of it and um, nice to reflect back on this because it's a really interesting unusual way to connect yeah <laughs> oh great oh great and another example of music bringing people together right Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we'll try to we'll try to unpack all this because there's a, a, a little bit of, of stuff going on here. But the but the basic gist of it is, as I said, this composer, this very well respected violinist and composer, was murdered, and the murder was never solved. And there were a lot. Of, it's like the game of Clue, right? There were a lot of pretty obvious mm -hmm. potential suspects. So who knows? A lot of people with a motive. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody held to account for it. And you are presenting this not just as a concert, but really as this sort of fleshed out um, theater presentation. Why don't you explain, both of you, why don't you sort of jump in and explain what the approach is and, and how you went sort of through each of the steps? So um, this this program, Who Killed the Claire, is actually one of Infusion Brook's original uh programs that we created back in, I think it was 2014 when we first uh, put on a version of this, of this, uh, of this concert. And originally it started off as this um, idea of a murder mystery, interactive murder mystery concert in which the concert itself would sort of play out uh, almost like a murder mystery game with the audiences being assigned the, the various uh, roles of the suspects in the, in the crime. And we performed we performed it this way for um, for a few years, a few times. But it was uh, it, it became very clear early on that this was very difficult to tour in this format. So then, from that sort of interactive game version, we created uh, more sort of uh, I guess you could call it more straightforward performance version in which. Uh, we would play the music of Leclerc and his contemporaries, uh, but also introduce the various suspects of the crime to the audience. Um, so there is actually, and everything that we present in the concert is actually historical fact. There's this wonderful uh, article by Albert Borowitz that really was the basis or, or the inspiration uh, for how the, how we present the story. And as you said, it really does play out like the game of Clue. So the, the prime suspects are the gardener, his wife, and the jealous nephew. Uh, and so in both the original version and the current version with Mike, we introduce each of these suspects uh, through the eyes of the lead inspector of the case, who was the actual lead inspector. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the show, we invite the audience to vote on who they think that the murderer was. And the interesting thing is that this this crime was actually never solved. And so it still mm -hmm. remains a mystery to this day. Uh, but I think that sort of, you know, both through the historical evidence and also how the characters play out in the performance, I think 
the audience generally sort of tends to lean one way, but I won't say which way that is. <laughs> I was going to ask you, darn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no Mike, spoiler. what's the, so, so you tell me how, how did you approach this from that, from the other side now of, of, of interjecting as the inspector and trying to tie this all together, you know, between the different um, possible suspects? Oh, yes. And so fascinating because, as Selene mentioned, it's really like a one person show. And I play the inspector primarily, but also the suspects. And it's kind of, I think, the question for the audience is is this inspector, you know, inhabiting these suspects and kind of like losing a little bit? Do they, is it really a representation of the suspects? So, this kind of line of, you know, reality and fiction and history and reality is kind of all blurred together and really fascinating to kind of unpack. So for me, it was kind of a really wild experience because it's such a unique thing to portray because usually um, this kind of project is not conceived in this way and not, you know, my role wouldn't be as comprehensive. So I really got to dive in and kind of research all the characters as well, the inspector and kind of see how much is it the inspector, how much is the character. And it's really interesting that you mentioned Clue because our film, uh, um, I guess the editor and the director of the film version, uh, Anna Shepard, who's incredible and so fun, she actually, the Clue movie, I don't know if you if you or any of the listeners know it, uh, she was really inspired by it and I, she actually had me watch it because I, did, I knew of it but I hadn't seen it before and I watched it and kind of got a little bit of a... Um, an insight into kind of her perspective, because of course the setting is quite removed from our time now, but Clue is obviously a little closer to where we are now. And so it's a really kind of playful and reimagining where it's this kind of very dark story, but in a very campy, dramatic and fun way also. So it was really interesting kind of to explore all these angles and to find all the different facets and um, kind of bring it into a more contemporary relevance. So it's interesting you mentioned that because it's exactly kind of what she really imagined for this project. And it was really fun because there were moments where like I would be walking over a dead body or, you know, stabbing myself and not to give too many spoilers, but there's some really m amazing moments and just like kind of delivering a dramatic speech, descending the stairs and looking to mirrors at myself. So just really uh, cinematic and very um, fun. But yeah, it was it was a story that I didn't really know even as a trained musician because I didn't come so much from the perspective in, in Baroque music myself and from violin music. And so learning about the story, I was like, wow, this is a really fascinating story that has not really been talked about too much and hasn't been presented in a way I think that is accessible to people because I think listening to a doctor doctoral you know dissertation or reading it or experiencing lecture settle sure is one way to get the info but the story is so dramatic really operatic really theatrical so I think this way of presenting it is a really great way to kind of introduce people to this very crazy story in a very crazy way but uh, yeah, it's a real, it, it was, and it still is a real tour de force for me. And um, we filmed it in both English and French, and uh, hopefully we'll have opportunities to present it live in both languages as well too. So it's about 16 pages of text for me in one language and the other. And um, it's all four, uh, four characters, the English script, came first and was written in iambic pentameter for the most part. Very Shakespearean, very Roger Hyams, the um, writer is so brilliant. Everyone was just always astounded at the, the quality and the level of the script writing and how sophisticated it is, yet still fun and moving and all of these aspects. And then it's translated into French, which is totally different. And the French writer as well, supremely gifted but because the language is different he also was sophisticated in a different way he rewrote some of it in alexandrine you know with a french um poetic meter and a different language to kind of reflect the same idea in in a different kind of cultural and linguistic kind of aspect so it was just a real really fascinating aspect and even for myself like thinking about my interpretation, I saw the characters one way, and then I learned something new about them, or I would get new information from Roger or Cellini or Infusion or Anna, and then kind of think, oh, maybe, because is it a different way? Because with historical figures, we have the facts, but there's still so much we don't know. So there was still so much, I think, leeway in terms of 
how you see them. And we're going to continue um, performing this version. We have another opportunity to perform it live for the very first time, at least for me. And I think even then it's still going to evolve and it will always change and grow because these characters just like us are, were alive, still are alive in a way. And there's so much, there's so many different directions you can go. And I, I'm, I feel like I'm still even just getting to know them because there's, there's so much that's said, but so much that's unsaid in a way also. Mm. Yeah. It's so interesting that you said that. I was going to ask you earlier if, if you were working from a, a set script, so now I know the answer to that. But I was also wondering how you were, how or if you're imparting, you know, maybe your own deeply held opinion about who the culprit was in the way that you are mm. presenting these various characters. What do you think? That's so fascinating. Um, just on my end, at least, I felt... Uh, you know, it was really difficult because, you know, as artists, I think we put ourselves into the work and as actors, but at the same time, we never want to hold judgment ourselves because ultimately the writer and the story itself has its own legacy and it's important for the audience to, you know, we don't want to spoil it for them. We want them to have their own journey. And so in a way, even though the story is kind of a legal situation, I felt almost interpreting it this way was very different than many other projects too. I had to really keep this kind of like legal impartiality and kind of reserve judgment and not try to put myself too much into anyone and really incriminate anybody or judge. Because I really feel it's written so well in that every character has their flaws, has their strengths and just really trying to, to see it from their point of view. And I think that's one of the magical things is that even though the inspector is the one who brings us in, each of the three characters have their own journey and we see it through their eyes. And mm -hmm. all of them could be guilty, all of them could be innocent, but ultimately I kind of realized it's my job just to kind of present it mm -hmm. and then leave it as impartially as I can for everyone else to kind of <laughs> take over. So you really played that role as the uh, impartial uh, investigator, that's great. Well, as the actor, yeah. I think the inspector also has opinions too. So that's also weird to unpack, you know, is it me, is it him, is it them? It was, yeah, very, I kind of, yeah, it was a really interesting road to go down because there's so many kind of questions and the blurring of reality and fiction and all right. of this. Right, right. Mm -hmm. From Infusion Baroque's perspective, we, we've we known these, these characters, these suspects for a very long time, having done this program mm. several times, introducing them ourselves and so and have we your own opinions too I'm yes. sure yes and yeah. so we we definitely and we we formulated our own theories and opinions and and then when we brought in Roger to write the script it was having it was almost like having a fresh set of eyes um mm. and I really appreciated how he sort of um imparted a lot of subtle nuances to each of the characters and sort of brought out sides to them that we didn't really think about and then again when the script went into mike's hands for interpretation again it was an, uh, another um interpretation so so yeah it was really interesting to see the program uh evolve in that way hmm. So talk about the music then, the musical selections and how you wove that into presenting the various suspects. Mm -hmm. So originally, um, we, when, when we first performed this, we sort of, we had a mixed program of Leclerc and many of his contemporaries from the 18th century, both uh, French and Italian composers. And um, I don't know if uh, Leclerc is one of those composers of the Baroque period that I think when you when you were sort of entrenched in this repertoire he stands out as a as an exceptional composer in in a sense that his every every single work that he creates has its it's 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 almost like he has his own um uh stamp his own fingerprint um he's unique and also just incredibly um incredibly wonderful as a composer but as a person he was actually not very nice you know in terms of what <laughs> what we can uh gain from you know historical records and he had you know at the end of his life he was um he sort of fell from grace and was living uh in a very bad part of paris estranged from his wife um he made a few enemies along the way throughout his career he was difficult to work with and so this was why it was interesting to sort of build in other composers who who liked or didn't like him um 
originally, but then at the for this current version, we have uh, built an entire program around Leclerc, uh, Leclerc's music. And so basically what happens is that we we are about to open the the concert with um, a piece by Leclerc <laughs> when the inspector um, rudely interrupts us and <laughs> declares to the audience that somebody's been murdered and goes into a whole spiel about how, you know, you must help us find who killed Leclerc. But then us musicians are like, well, can, can we play something first, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so we kind of continue this pattern of um, the inspector comes in, he, you know, is quite, you know, uh, he interacts with the audience, um, he introduces the suspects, we play some music, uh, next suspect is introduced until finally, all three of the suspects have been brought out. And we ask the audience to give their opinion, you know, to, to pass judgment, I suppose, on, on the three suspects. And then we finish uh, with more music. So it go, yeah, so there's a, the music is sort of woven into the narrative itself. Mm -hmm. And, and who, what, so what are the pieces that you're playing? And is there a significance to which pieces you've chosen or are they just representative of these people more generally? Mm -hmm. There, yes, I mean, there, so we open with, uh, with an overture from his uh, Deuxième Recreation de Musique, which is a, a whole suite of uh, basically French dance pieces. Um, and we play a few movements from, from that suite sort of interspersed throughout the concert. Uh, we also play uh, some of his wonderful trio sonatas. Uh, mm -hmm. I play a movement from one of his violin sonatas called Le Tombeau, which was actually thought to have been arranged for orchestra and played at his funeral. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do, and then we finish with some more movements from uh, the Deuxième Recreation. Mm -hmm. Mike, why don't you talk about the, the sort of the, the particular characteristics of each of these, these characters that you're playing? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, definitely four characters indeed. And I must say, just following what Selene was saying, uh, I just, you know, as a musician myself too, it's so wonderful to, well, I mean, acting, especially this length and marathon kind of performance is challenging, but on the musical side, not to be involved on that side and just to sit there and enjoy in the interludes, what a treat. And I really I have the prime seat really up close and personal. It was really uh, wonderful for me to be in the rehearsals and filming. And I'm sure in our shows, because I, I will be enjoying it as the inspector with the, along with the audience, what a treat it is to have such a front row, you know, experience of the music. And especially being so engrossed in kind of the behind the scenes aspect of the of who created this music but um yes we have this inspector as we heard from Cellini, uh who barges in and i think that really gives you a sense of who this man is um it's uh, he's very goal oriented very business-like professional and you know he's an inspector and almost in a way has to remove himself from the emotion of the situation to get his job done in this and other situations that he's regularly involved in investigating. And um, from what I know, he also had a military background, which was kind of interesting to discover because it kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into the kind of person he is or maybe isn't <laughs> because uh, there's an element that is a little bit removed from our, our normal, hopefully more empathetic human condition. But it's again written in such a wonderful way that as he begins to interview and interrogate everybody, I think you start to see parts of the humanity, you know, emerge. That said, I think there's a fair amount of frustration as well too because the three suspects don't make it necessarily easy for him to get to the truth. Uh, I guess in chronological order, we meet the gardener first. Paisan or Paisan, depending on, we had, we had to figure out exactly pronunciation and which language was which um, in terms of, you know, the, the pronunciation aspect. But uh, this uh, Paisan, he is this, uh, you know, lower class gardener and, you know, can be seen as a bumbling fool, but also so is it an act? Because in, in reality, historically, a little bit of a shady character with, you know, possibly some illegal side business activity going on mm -hmm. too. So um, we're, we're kind of meet this gardener who's kind of older and single and is a neighbor of Leclerc's. 
he didn't enjoy the music so much and was rather frustrated by it and annoyed, as maybe some of my neighbors can also agree with in my tiny condo here in Toronto um, sometimes. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, again, we have this ambiguous aspect. Then we meet Louise Seclair, who's the recent widow of Jean-Marie, and uh, she clearly loves him a lot. She's a working woman, a very educated woman who's working in engraving and very supportive of Leclerc, obviously. But as we start to realize, things were not so picture perfect. And as Cellini mentioned, Leclerc, as much as we idolize these figures once they've passed, we know from the record, and of course, as all of us are human, there were some challenges and they were separated at the time of the murder. So it calls into question, you know, you know, what were her motives and what was she, how were her feelings really of her husband? Because they weren't all just rosy. Uh, as much as we would like to have sympathy for her. Um, might have been convenient for her not to have had a husband anymore, especially one that was uh, a little bit uh, irritating and difficult and inconvenient at that time. Hmm. And then finally we meet, uh, it's François Guillaume Vial. I think we realized, <laughs> even in filming, that no, we might be filming the names. Guillaume François. No, Guillaume François. Yeah, Guillaume François Vial. Yeah. I need to yeah. double check yeah. that before you do this next time, so I make sure I get the right, uh, the right order. And uh, he's, of course, the nephew of the deceased Leclerc. And again, there's a, a familial relationship, something that's more of a kindred relationship. But as we know in crime, it doesn't always mean that, in fact, sometimes it, if you have a connection with the victim, Sometimes it's even more so with Louise and Guillaume Francois, for example, even more so. But um, Guillaume Francois is uh, a little bit more haughty and arrogant. He's an up and coming musician, and you know maybe didn't think his uncle was all that hot stuff either. Um, but uh, quite an interesting character as well too. But um, kind of brazenly, you know, says you know so what if I did it kind of thing. So quite an interesting kind of character, and I find very interesting because the inspector has a little bit of this energy as well and they kind of really have a little face off mm -hmm. and kind of try to one-up each other which is rather challenging to do as the same person and also to distinguish it so that you're still seeing two people mm -hmm. but it was a really interesting dramatic kind of challenge and uh, moment and uh, I mean I think at that point the inspectors may be losing it I think I might be too because <laughs> it's really yeah fascinating and such different emotional journeys and to kind of come in and out of each character but really really rewarding I would say so rich for me to kind of be unpacking all of it and taking this journey along and um, you know stretching myself to really go all these different places because Roger and Joelle who wrote the scripts really go there mm -hmm. so you know I have to go with them. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just want to say it. It actually is François Guillaume. <laughs> I think we're just confusing ourselves at this point. <laughs> but you were right. You were right. We, do we know the truth, even of their names? You know, it's, it's. Who knows? So mystery much, at this point. <laughs> so much of a mystery. Oh my goodness. Um, so you have recorded this, but you also are going to be performing it live. Where can people see the recorded version of it? So the video will be uh, premiering with the Early Music Vancouver Digital uh, Concert, okay. uh, Concert House on October 22nd. Um, and you can see, uh, you can purchase tickets and have more details at Early Music Vancouver's website. Oh, okay. And then um, you're going to be also performing live. Is there an intention to kind of keep it going or will it just be surrounding yes, the release I mean, of this of the film? We have our first we have the first live performance of this this new version in December uh, with a series in Quebec. Uh, it's the um, it's in Repentigny. Uh, this will be the French version. And we do continue to plan to tour both versions in the future. I mean, this has always been one of Infusion Brooks more popular tour offerings. Presenters are always fascinated by, <laughs> by this program and what does it mean and, and you know, how does it work? So so we definitely continue to uh we definitely want to continue to tour it and um you know it's just so exciting to see to 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 um to collaborate with mike in this capacity just because the old version was was the four of us and we you know as i said you know we we would introduce the subject uh, suspects but sort of more in a in a clinical way you know we would just give a brief uh 
biography essentially and and their motives but uh you know in this version you know mike really does a wonderful job of bringing each of these characters to life mm -hmm. i did want to add though however um forgot to mention that we in the film version and the live version there are lines for all the four of them, not as the suspects, but as the musicians themselves. So there's a little bit of this breaking the fourth wall moment. Yeah. And the film version in particular that I don't think we can accomplish live, there's a little bit of um, movie magic, shall we say, in terms of what happens with them and our interactions. So it's all very fascinating. So they do have lines, but fortunately I'm relieving them of that burden primarily. <laughs> And uh, I did want to also mention that the the film version releasing on October 22nd, Selena, do you want to share the significance of this date as well? Yes. I thought this was very well thought out. Yeah. So Leclerc's body was found in the early morning of October 23rd, 17, uh, 1764. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so he was in fact murdered. It was believed that he was killed the night of October 22nd. So we will be <laughs> presenting this who killed Leclerc on the anniversary of his death. Ooh, and it's a week <laughs> before Halloween. Yes, exactly. indeed. <laughs> well, it sounds delightful. I cannot wait to see it myself. I have been speaking on Zoom with Infusion Baroque's violinist Salini Amawat and Mike Fan about their project Who Killed LeClaire. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, Suzanne. Mesdames, Messieurs, je vous prie que personne ne bouge. Un homme vient à l'instant d'être assassiné. Avec votre aide, nous devons établir l'identité de celui ou de celle qui a commis ce crime. 